really delighted to be here and uh, we'll talk a little bit about the various aspects of the history of bicycling in Boston area for the last 150 years and then hopefully we'll have a lot of time for discussion afterwards. So that's my goal. Um, so basically I've, I've written the three books and I want to dedicate um, tonight particularly to Kitty Knox who was a courageous young woman of the 19th century. And I'll speak a bit about her as we go through the presentation tonight and describe her in more detail. The enduring questions for me in writing is basically who can ride with whom, which really gets to issues of race and ethnicity and gender and so on, and where do they go and how are they dressed? which turns out to be particularly an apropos question for women riders in the 19th century. Uh, with what type of bicycle and equipment? So we know about the old high wheels and the kinds of bikes we see around today, but we seldom see on the streets anyway, uh, vehicles like hand cycles for people who uh, have uh, lower uh, extremity uh, disabilities. Um, but they have become very popular, particularly with the veteran population that we have from the uh, Iraq and Afghanistan wars, where there were so many uh, veterans who were disabled in that way. It's gotten to be a very big thing. And um, also devices like uh, what they call uh, tandem bicycles and what they call blind stokers, which is where we have a sighted person in the uh, front seat, the pilot, and then a blind stoker in the back seat. And it provides an enormous opportunity for people to get out on the road that they might, would not have otherwise. So at what speeds um, are questions that are always apropos when we get into the whole issue of a bike uh, trail, for example. How fast can or should you ride when there are pedestrians? maybe alongside, maybe in front of you, and we need to keep safe. So how safe are we for ourselves and other road users? And then with what comfort? Um, people now are riding what they call e-bikes, which are more comfortable because they give you a little extra boost on the hill. So oh, that's all. those are all issues too. So those are the enduring questions I've tried to you know, deal with over 150 years of history. Uh, the broad brush is that uh, there's a bicycle rise and fall and then a rise again. So we got the beginnings in the 1870s and 80s, the bicycling craze in the 1890s, a big bust in the early 1900s, a little mini boom in the 1930s, and then finally the Renaissance which started in the 1970s, kind of coincident with the rise of the environmental movement and, uh, and beyond. And we'll talk through all of those stages. The beginning, Boston Bicycle Club of 1878. That was the first bicycle club in America. Uh, and it is a very interesting club because it was marked by its pattern of exclusion. Who could not join? Who could join were kind of upper middle class gentlemen. And in particular, they didn't want anybody who was not a gentleman in the club. Uh, and that included almost anybody who worked for a living, that is, worked in a laboring job. And in some cases, even people who worked on bicycles were not allowed to join because they were defined as professionals. And nobody who was a professional could be part of this gentleman's club. There they are in 1878. And there they are again in military formation in Trinity Square, which many of you probably know of Trinity Church in what we now call Copley Square. And the, that was before the uh, Boston Public Library was built even. Um, but there they are in military formation. That was really important to these gentlemen riders, that they ride in a formation. And they call out to one another with uh, bugles. 
And uh, so there's a publication that uh, uh, illustrates about 15 different bicycle bugle calls, and here are two of them right here. Prepare to mount and mount, which is a key issue for cyclists, particularly those of the 19th century. And they got to racing. There's a track at the corner of West Newton and Huntington, a board track laid out and uh, for a, a week of racing. Huge tent. It's, not, it's where Northeastern University is now. Um, and the other thing they did besides race is they got involved in touring. So they would tour around, uh, around, all around the Boston area. And uh, this was a very famous tour called the Wheel Around the Hub of 1879. And what made it famous is that they um, had it written up in Scribner's Magazine, which was a popular kind of upper middle class magazine at the time that had nationwide distribution. And that kind of blew the lid off of bicycling. It spread all over the country, basically as a result of the ride up they got of their tour around Boston, starting in uh, Roxbury and down to Sharon and then over to the shore, and Cohasset, and finally back to Boston again. A two-day event which went down in history. And we can illustrate that. Uh, and here's an illustration from Scribner's, taking a header from the wheel around the hub. Somebody hit a stone in the road, <laughs> flying over the handlebars. And of course, the uh, cyclists, the gentlemen cyclists, and they were all gentlemen, by the way, uh, no gentlewomen, uh, all prepared themselves by having a uh, horse-drawn uh, wagon along with them that would bring their food and also an ambulance to take care of the injured cycles and cyclists along the way. And here's another illustration from Scribner's. And uh, like I say, this really boomed the popularity of cycling during that time. Uh, here's uh, an advertisement for Columbia bicycles. And you kind of see the evolution of cycles. If you look way in the background, you'll see somebody on a big wheel tricycle. Then there's somebody on a tandem. There's somebody on the big wheel on the uh, right-hand side. And then there are two properly attired ladies and gentlemen in the, uh, in the front row there. And as you look at the uh, woman in the, front, in the front there, you'll notice that she's wearing a quite long skirt, which was the requirement at the time, and uh, wearing and riding a drop frame bicycle, which was meant to accommodate the long skirt. And uh, so that was kind of the character of cycling by now, the 1890s. And the bicycles having uh, two equally sized wheels and a chain drive and better than rudimentary brakes. And uh, of course, a skirt guard on the chain so that the lady would not uh, muss up her skirt, her long skirt. Well, by the early 1890s, there were a tremendous number of clubs around Boston. And the Boston Globe illustrated them with all the different caps that they had that identified them. What's that? Yeah, yeah. Well, they're all, well you see, there are a couple of, uh, of caps there uh, worn by women riders. And Boston, in fact, had the largest per capita number of women riders of any city in the country. And also up on the uh, uh, second from right on the top there, there's a cap worn by a black rider. And there was, a, in fact, a black cycling club in Boston called the Riverside Club, about which we will hear more later. So it was tremendously popular in this period that we call the craze. And here's the Boston Herald Bicycle Parade. Probably uh, several thousand people showed up to parade. As you can see, there's a bicycling band from Lynn um, involved in the parade, how they carried the bass drums and the trombones and the tubas and whatnot on the bike. Hard to say, but they did. <laughs> 
That was a hugely popular. There were 10,000 people in the lining uh, Commonwealth Ave and Beacon Street to watch the parade go by. A great, uh, and people paraded a lot in those days. And this is a great adaptation to it. So League of American Wheelmen was the national organization. And a couple of important things happened there. One is that they passed a resolution supported by many of the Southern chapters against having any new black members after 1894. And uh, it was uh, protested by the Massachusetts delegation, among others, and protested by the Riverside Cycle Club, the All Black Cycle Club in Boston, um, and by Kitty Knox. And we'll talk more about her later. The other thing that was really prohibited was women racing. Because uh, the fear was that if women raced, they would develop bicycle face or bicycle back or would interfere with their fertility or in a variety of other problems. And so really they were forbidden from racing and, and male clubs that sanctioned women racing at events uh, were threatened with punishment by the, by the league. So it was quite a struggle. Those were the big struggles in the 1890s. Well, the Riverside Club, as I said, protested their exclusion and it instructed the delegates from Massachusetts to remove the word white only from the Constitution of the League of American Wheelmen. So uh, that was a, a big, big deal during that period of 1894, 1895 and around in there. It never happened, but Robert Timo, who was a member, was also a state legislator at the time. And he got the Massachusetts State Legislature to pass a resolution against the League's national policy against black members. And uh, the original still exists in the Massachusetts State Archives. We were fortunate to have. The other person who's what, worth mentioning is Kitty Knox because she was one of those women who was kind of busting out to race but couldn't because of the league policies. Um, and here's a headline from the uh, Boston Post magazine, or Boston Post newspaper at the time. And as you can see, they really kind of boosted her. And they called her a champion scorcher. That was one of the uh, sort of epithets thrown at women riders who rode fast was, you're just a scorcher. You're riding too fast. Uh, but they appeared to uh, be a little softer towards her and, and appreciate her, her riding. She was very fast. She was also a long distance rider, rode century rides, 100 mile rides, and really became very well known in Boston. Uh, lived in the west end of Boston, right on Cambridge Street. Well, what developed in that period were cycle tracks. And here's one in Waltham. Uh, you can see some racers getting ready to race, but clearly women were not allowed to race during that time. So Kitty Knox, who was a seamstress, took part in a women's cycling costume contest at the Waltham cycle track in 1895, and she won, but she was hissed by some in the crowd. And we will never know whether she was hissed because she was a biracial black cyclist, or whether it was because of the way she was a scorcher, fast rider, or was it because of the way she was dressed, because she refused to wear the traditional long skirt. And as you'll see in this next picture, there she is, at uh, a big national meet at Asbury Park, New Jersey for the League of American Wheelmen. If you look closely, you can see she's got her league ribbons on. Even though there was a prohibition against black members, the Boston delegation down there argued that since she had become a member before the prohibition, she was entitled to all the privileges of league membership. So she's wearing her ribbon, she's got her badge on her cap, but look at the bicycle she's got. A men's bicycle, no drop frame. And look what she's wearing. She's wearing what could have, would have been called bloomers or 
Pantaloons, as I said. Yes, that's right. That's right, pantaloons. There you go. So she made quite a splash in Asbury Park. The, her splash there, because of the tr attempts to oust her, made national news and even international news. Some of the newspapers up in Canada covered the struggle over Kitty Knox and her being at uh, Asbury Park, part of the league meeting. So the other big well-known track is the Charles River Park, which was right along the Charles River, or close to it anyway. The little artistic license here, it shows it right on the river. It's actually a block away. It's where um, the uh, Nico Candy family to, uh, uh, factory took over when the uh, track was torn apart. A couple of the well-known people who raced there included Major Taylor, who's a black racer, very well-known, uh, international fame, and uh, a world champion racer. And this is one of the first integrated uh, professional teams in America. Included him, included Nat and Frank Butler and Burns Pierce, who were all Canadians, and had immigrated here, and Eddie McDuffie, who was a local resident as well. So there they are in a portrait, and they, they were part of the uh, Boston Pursuit team that beat a team from Philadelphia up here at the park in uh, 1897 quite well covered in the press. So the key figure in this is not only Major Taylor, but also Nat Butler, because Nat Butler has a very strong connection to Revere that some of you may already know. But first, he went off to race in Europe. After the Charles River track got demolished, he went off to race in Europe. This is a postcard that exists here in the museum. And uh, showing him tucked in behind a motorcycle, kind of a rudimentary motorcycle. And that's how they raced in that day, or at least some of them did. It was called motor paced racing, and that was to increase the speed of the cyclist because they could tuck in behind the motorcycle and draft off the motorcycle and increase their speed enormously. Uh, that's a postcard he sent from Dresden when he was over in Europe, he made several trips to Europe and raced over there and uh, was quite successful at it. So that's Nat Butler, and we want to follow him a little bit because then he came to Revere. And uh, here he is. This is motor paced racing at the Revere cycle track in the, um, and this flyer actually comes from the 1920s. Nat Butler was managing the track, and there were all kinds of racers. I don't know if you can see their names, but many of them are um, Italian-Americans who uh, raced at the track, Belgians, French, and whatnot. And the track owners always made a great point of uh, pointing out a kind of race and ethnicity, because that drove customers an audience to the park because that created an additional excitement. Um, so that's a motor pace, 25 mile, I think it is, motor pace racing event at the, uh, at the Revere track in the 1920s. Now here's one of those racers who raced very frequently. His name was Vincent, uh, called Pusha Madonna. And uh, he was named that way by apparently his Italian-American fans who kept urging him to push the race. So he eventually became known as Pusha Madonna, or Pusha Madonna. And uh, he actually raced at many of the tracks here because there was a whole circuit around. There was Revere, there was a track at Worcester, there was one in Providence, one down in New Bedford, and they would ride the circuit around this New England area they do Monday and Wednesday at one track, Tuesday and Thursday at another track, and so on. So they could race the entire week, make a ton of uh, prize money if they were good, and uh, that was it. And those tracks um, listed variously up through the teens and 20s. Uh, so there's Vincent Pushamadan.
There's the track right there that is also a, an illustration that you've got here in the museum. That's another postcard. I forget the streets that it's in between, but it's right near the beach. Yeah. And that was a great uh, draw because when it, near the beach, people could go to the beach on the narrow gauge uh, railway and then they could get off the beach, they could go watch the bicycle races. It was very popular. In that. Now this is not a motor pace race. This is a sprint race. And um, they operated both kinds on that track. And I'm just saying, you know, if you can imagine a uh, bicyclist following a uh, motorcycle around the bank track there, you kind of uh, have a very scary pop proposition. Um, one of the people who raced on the track in the teens and early in the 20s, a man named uh, Ned Chandler, who was an immigrant from Barbados, a uh, biracial man who was, uh, came here in 1910. And by 1915, he was making a great name for himself racing uh, on, the, on the track. He mainly raced at Revere here. Um, quite an interesting, interesting guy. Eventually, in the early 1920s, went to uh, Berlin and to Europe, raced in uh, Europe, France, North Africa and back into uh, Germany. And there he is in Berlin, racing in 1921 with a group of other sprinters. So what happened after the 1920s is uh, not much. The tracks declined, Revere really went bust. And the next significant thing I think, to, significant thing I think to talk about is the Finally, women got the right to race. And uh, the, America, the uh, American uh, Amateur Bicyclists Association actually set up a women's division in 1937. This is their first national championship. There's a Worcester rider in the middle there, Frances Palmer, who was the New England champ, but she went to the national championships in Buffalo and came in last. And part of the reason for that is that all the cycle tracks that would help to train people went totally bankrupt in New England, but they still existed in New Jersey and New York and Pennsylvania and places like that. Uh, so people got a chance to practice and learn what they were doing. So uh, New England entered a long period of decline in terms of uh, racing. Fast forward, 1972 the start of the environmental movement. This is the Bicycle Repair Collective over in Cambridge in 1972. You couldn't look at that and not guess that it would have been in the 1960s or 1970s, right? And uh, this was a great little group. It still exists over in Cambridge on Broadway. It's now called the Broadway Bicycle School. If you ever go over there, um, you can talk to them about this, their forerunner. It's been in continuous operation there since uh, 19, 1972, really. Here's one of their jerseys. T-shirts, -shirt, you'll see the, uh, and you look at the design of the, uh, the wheels. They're male and female equality. Their slogan was seize the wrench. And they were hoping to create this collective and seize the wrench from the for-profit bicycle shops and create a whole different model for how a bicycle shop might operate, which they struggled with for years because they would get involved in endless sort of philosophical arguments about whether to pass on the cost of, uh, increased cost of an bolt or nut onto the customer and when they got an increase from the manufacturer. Somebody who lived on my floor, I went to MIT in the, in the 70s, somebody who lived on my floor started up the bicycle workshop in Cambridge, okay. which is still there across where the Neko factory was. There you go. There's a pizza place. Uh, okay. <laughs> so he was, he was one of those rotten capitalists. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a great, this is an old t-shirt. Get a photo of. So that's seven, 1970s. 
and commuting. I know someone here is a real commuter. This was, uh, that was the start of the commuter movement. And here's the uh, Boston uh, Common Bike Day in 1979, which really promoted the idea of commuting to work. Um, we've got now commuter re recreational bikeways to the sea, Shining Sea Path, Falmouth, Minuteman, Danvers, Cape Cod Rail Trail, all kinds of trails have developed frequently in the face of significant opposition where neighborhood abutters didn't want the idea of cyclists coming through their neighborhoods and stealing their TV sets and riding off with them and whatnot. Let me say a little bit about women's racing. I showed you the 1937 photo, but in the 1980s, women's racing really came to the fore, but in a kind of an odd way because um, this is actually a photo of women racing at, on Martha's Vineyard. But the pattern there was, if you know Martha's Vineyard, you know there's that little common area uh, near the tabernacle. And uh, this is their racing around. There's probably a mile distance altogether to get all the way around. Well, in the meantime, that's called a criterium race or a crit. In the meantime, the men are all racing all over the island. So the women are kind of uh, a little bit of entertainment while the men are going out to the other end of the island and back, and of course collecting all the prize money. And, uh, and then uh, in the meantime, the audience is being entertained by this women's crit. And that was a very common pattern during the 1980s and uh, was only broken by a couple of races. Um, and there's one of them. That's the Or Ida Women's Challenge in the Sawtooth Mountains of Idaho. That was a stage race. It went on for a week. So it would be mountain routes. It would be flatland routes. It would be time trials. It would be crits or criteriums as well. But it was all women. And there are other races that contain both men and women, like the Coors race out in Colorado, and the Red Zinger race out in Colorado. And they frequently had less challenging courses for women than they did for the men. Orida was an all-women's race, and the organizer of it, who worked for the Orida Potato Company, um, said, I'm going to really break all of the prohibitions against women racing long hills and long distances. And he did that. And uh, he was brought up under charges by the International Cycling Federation, who said that he had uh, created races that were too excessive for women, excessive distances, excessive days, excesses of everything you could name. And uh, in defiance, uh, the women printed a t-shirt that said, let's get excessive, <laughs> and rode with that. And, uh, and uh, every day when they started racing, uh, the race announcer would remind them of that. And uh, they would, uh, in a great shout, take off. And we're getting excessive. <laughs> So uh, it was quite a, that's quite a story of the uh, Orida challenge. I, I mentioned the, the Coors and uh, the Red Zinger. Uh, the organizers of the Coors, when the Coors went bankrupt, essentially, um, went off and tried to find some other things. Now, their race contained both men and women uh, in different heats and different segments, although the women's were always shorter. Uh, but they went off and uh, got involved with another race that's maybe not as well known these days, the Tour de Trump <laughs> from 1989. It's hilarious. It's and uh, now this is an interesting, an interesting uh, little case because uh, Donald Trump promised three years of support to create a uh, Tour de France type of event on the East Coast. The other races had all been kind of West, Colorado or West Coast. Uh, 
He wanted to create one on the East Coast that would circle around the various Trump properties. And uh, he bragged that this was going to be the greatest race since the uh, Tour de France. The problem with it, several problems with it, uh, one of which is he did not want women in the race. He, uh, so there was no women's racing, and that led to the decline uh, for a time of women's racing. Um, the other pro several other problems included the fact that there was a big demonstration as the riders came through town in New Paltz, New York in 1989. Um, and they had all kinds of placards up protesting against Trump's evictions of people in these New York City properties and uh, a variety of other signs that were uh, used for protest that day. The um, race didn't last uh, for the three years he promised uh, because Donald Trump ran into some financial difficulties and a divorce, had to get rid of his yacht and uh, also got rid of his wife and uh, that cost him. And, uh, but it did go through 1990 and the 1990 race finished in Boston, which is one of the reasons I wanted to bring that into the, into the picture. It was won by a, a very famous Mexican racer named Raul Acala. Uh, but after that, the race disappeared. Well, I always like to say a little bit about whatever happened to. Um, think about some of the people we've talked about. So Major Taylor, who we mentioned, who was part of the Boston Pursuit team with Nat Butler, his brother Frank, Burns Pierce, and Eddie McDuffie has a statue in his honor out by the library in uh, Worcester now. Developed about, uh, I would say about 15 years ago now that they put that in. Really led by uh, Lynn Tolman, who's the president of the, uh, uh, one of the leading lights in the uh, Major Taylor Association out there. Uh, we can talk about Kitty Knox. We did a ride in her honor on June 5th. That was just this last Sunday. And there's a picture of the, uh, some of the riders. We had about 100 and 130 riders all together. Where was this? This uh, was all around. It started in Franklin Park, went through Copley Square, and went down through, um, around through downtown Boston, back out Cambridge Street, passed in front of her house that she lived in when she was a young woman in the 1890s. And from there over to Cambridge and to her burial site, which is in Mount Auburn Cemetery. And from there out to the Waltham cycle track, which is uh, now a little baseball field for kids out in Waltham, went out there and visited the, the remains of the grandstand, uh, the concrete supports for the grandstand, which still exists on a little hillside out there. So it was quite a fun day. So, and uh, the Starbucks out on Cambridge Street, if you go into Boston along Cambridge Street, you'll see a Starbucks coffee shop. That was her home in the 1890s, still exists. Although it's now cut up into six small apartments. But the uh, manager of Starbucks coffee was willing to put up a uh, banner in Kitty Knox's honor uh, this last Sunday. So all of this material, we uh, try to get into the bicycling history collections at UMass Boston. A great collection now. And uh, we've got some of the material from uh, Major Taylor and Eddie McDuffie. And uh, we're going to put some of the material from this ride from last Sunday into the archives so that somebody who 30 years or 40 years or 50 years from now says, you know, I'm really interested in this event. Who was there? What did they do? Why did they do it? And this will be a resource for them to use. So I would encourage you, if you have any cycling materials, to put it there. Or if you have anything else, you know, find your local archive and make sure it gets saved. Because otherwise, it either gets burned up or flooded out, 
Or it might be that you simply get sickly and die, and then your children say, well, what am I going to do with this stuff? And ultimately, they just throw it away. So uh, something all of us need to be kind of conscious of. Mm -hmm.